Australian's probably the most decorated player that we have in the competition at the moment. Dan, tell us a little bit about your first memories of football. Um, firstly, it was probably um, my brother actually set up a, a Sunday league team, if you like, um, under sixes. Um, and we, it was just 11 kids basically just having fun. Um, and that's when I knew I sort of did to want to get into football, it was something, it was just a, a hobby and then within a year I was I was picked up as a sort of a professional club which was which was good. So this was all in Sunderland wasn't it? Um, I actually spent um, a year in Newcastle, um, just the, the first year with John Carver who was previously a Newcastle manager, um, so we, we had a year there, he coached the, the, the younger team and um, I moved on to Sunderland just because it was closer to travel and, and um, John Carver moved on to the reserves um, and I felt my place was at Sunderland really and since then I, I was always at Sunderland, yeah. Okay, so under sixes, mm -hmm. how, how um, advanced was the, the playing skills of the, of the kids <laughs> playing at that age? You'd be surprised, I mean it, there was always, um, I had like to say, just to, to name a few, it was Adam Johnson and, and them sort of players who, who always sort of stood out at a young age. Um, and the standard was, was really, really good. And you could always see the players that stood out because you play against them on a, on a Sunday as well for the, for the Sunday League team. Um, and they would stand out in a mile. So the standard was, was good, but you got that with the, the high level of coaching. Were you tall for your age? I actually was, believe it or not. Um, I'm probably on this, well, definitely on the small side now. Um, but until probably about 16, I was always the, the biggest. I stopped growing and probably, I was probably bigger then than I am now, to be honest. We hear stories about uh, the English academies yeah. picking the, the big kids. Mm. So you fit that mould? I would say so. I mean, I always backed my ability. I was, you know, ability-wise was, was always something I, I felt that was my strongest, strongest point. I was just happy to be, at the time, blessed with um, a good physique and, you know, I was quick and, and all the rest of it. Um, but there, there was, you know, the other end of the the spectrum type thing where there was lads who were really really gifted um, on the small side but they, they knew that at some point they would they would start to grow and start to develop. In your junior years yeah you got some England call-ups yeah. tell us about that. Yeah um, all together I think it was 2021 20, caps for England um, I had the pleasure to be to be uh, captain as well and won a, won a couple of tournaments with England, which was which was always nice to represent a country at any level, really. So I think it was under 16s to 19s, 20s, um, represented them at a, at a good level. And Tell us a bit more about that. Um, well, it started off, I was at school, 15s, we had, I think there was about 300 boys trialling, uh, managed to get them down to, to, I think it was to 30, and then we had two squads, different tournaments, and then we'd whittle it down to, I think it was 19, 20. Um, 16s, 17s, 18s, 19s, 20s, and we, you know, we got to go all over and play against the, the best players in the world, which was which was great. So, 16, mm. you're playing for England. Mm. You must be absolutely thrilled. How how hard are you working to maintain that position? Yeah, I mean, dedication's easily the the biggest thing in football. People talk about ability. I mean, ability is probably a, a very small fraction of what what you need to be a footballer. Um, I'd probably say 90% of it is actually dedication and the, the want to, to separate yourself from, from everything else. Um, and that's why Premier League players are the way they are. You know, some of them haven't got the greatest ability, but they've, they've separated and, and made that their lives, you know. Fair play to them. What sort of commitments did you have to make at that time? Um, sacrifices. Yeah, sacrifices. Um, kind of, it was one where friends were going out and doing things socially on weekends and stuff like that. Obviously, I couldn't do it. Um, being at the academy as well, it was, it was pretty full on. It was pretty much full-time football up until the age of 16 anyway. Um, so they learn you at a very young age that you're training three, four times a week. So it, it just came with it where, you know, y your friends started, a, you'd see your friends less and less and your football would become your life. Yeah. Do you have any regrets about that? No, not at all. Um, I think a lot of people you know, kids playing today would, would be pretty proud of saying that they pr play professional at any level. Um, so I was blessed enough to, to make a start in the Premier League, which was, which was good. So tell us about that. What happened to, how did you get your start? Um, initially, I was, I was on loan actually at Huddersfield and Mick McCarthy, who was manager at the time, said, look, have a couple of months away, um, see how you do. 
kind of wanted to, to make a man out of me because I, I played reserves and, and I was doing well there, but he felt the next step was to um, to go out on loan. Went out on loan um, and he rang me and said, look, we want you back to play against Bolton in the Premier League. And Sullen were already down then. So there was a toss-up between, do I play the semi-finals, I think it was with Huddersfield at Wembley, um, or do I play in the Premier League? And, and two days later, Mick McCarthy actually got sacked. Um, so I thought, there's me, there's me chance gone to play in the Premier League at that time. Um, and then it was Kevin Ball who actually took over as a caretaker manager. And he gave me a call and said, look, nothing's changed. Get your, get your backside up and, and, and play this game. So within two hours, I was driving up to uh, back up to Sunderland and uh, train on the Friday to prepare for the game on Saturday. How excited are you? Oh, I mean, it was, it was one of them things at the age of, I think I was 18, um, it's something that you dreamt of when as soon as you start kicking a ball. You know, me, me brother actually played with Sunderland as well, and just watching him at the old stadium, Roker Park, it was something that I always wanted to do. And reality didn't really sink in until I see myself on match of the day after the game. You know, the, the game sort of passed me by, and um, it was it was something certainly to, to tell the grandkids. That's for sure. What are the little things that you remember about that time? Um, it was just sort of surreal the fact that. You actually were on the. You were training with. I mean, I was always training with the first team. But you're sitting around, and you know you've got players of, of you know, players you used to play with on FIFA. You know, you used to actually play with them on FIFA and, and play against um, Ivan Campbell, um, Kevin Nolan, Yuri Jorgaev was on the pitch. Um, it was just surreal. You know, I used to buy them on Championship Manager, <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're playing against them. You know, so it was it was pl- pretty surreal until. I watched it back and I seen, you know, my little legs running around on the pitch. It, it was kind of, you know, it took me back a little bit. By the third game, mm. did you feel that, <coughs> did you ever really feel a part of it? It's still early days. I mean, you, even though you're training with the first team, I was training with them for a good few years. Um, it was always one of them where until I think you had 20, 30 league games under your belt, you, you always felt like a fringe player. You know, I went on pre-season tours and stuff like that at 17 year old but you never feel a part of it as such I mean it was a, you're always a bit player and I f- think the fact that we went down that that, that year um, we were already down it was just kind of everyone was kind of playing for themselves uh, which was sad to see but again it was it was fantastic to be a part of um, great bunch of lads but just unfortunately we had if there was going to be a time to make your debut that probably wasn't the best time because the team spirit was down and you know everyone was trying to play, play for themselves either a to get a move somewhere back in the Premier League or you know to win a new contract. Mm. So it was a that, that's probably the the one thing I'd probably say was a little bit negative. All right, let's talk about that white elephant in the room, yeah. the game against Arsenal. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about what happened beforehand. Um, so it was what well, I was playing and I, I just remember. Uh, the ball got played over to, to Diaby and he's kind of let the ball run um, and he's six foot five, six foot six, whatever he is, you know, his legs are probably five foot of that. Um, and little old me sort of went in, we both went in to, to make the tackle and he's, he's managed to nick the ball and, and I'm still committing. Um, I didn't even get a yellow card for it and the ref said, look, just sort of settle yourself down. But I was playing at home, it was my home Premier League debut, I was fired up. There wasn't any intent in it, no malice. It was just the fact that he happened to be a little bit sharper than me, and he's won the ball, and I've I've already committed. Um, but yeah, it was it was disappointing. I mean, I, I tried to send me apologies to him, and um, I actually wrote him a card and tried to text him and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, but yeah, it was left at that. What happened after that game? I, I know that Arsene Wenger was uh, yeah. pretty strong in his criticism <laughs> of you. Yeah. Tell us about what happened to you after that game. Um, I remember. You had a pile of, on the Monday, we had a pile of players get the fan mail, they get the, the hate mail kind of thing. Um, and my hate mail was probably about this big, and my fan mail was probably about two. And yeah, it, it was difficult to take, and for an 18 year old boy to, to sort of look at um, wasn't nice. And you know, you got a lot of abuse, the, the papers and Sky Sports News and, and all the rest of it. It was, it was well documented. But it was just one of them things that. What can you do? You know, you, you knew in your heart of hearts that, that there was no malice in it and no intent, but, you know, papers will be papers, I guess. Uh, and, it, and it, you know, for an 18-year-old kid, it kind of gets you down. Did you bother reading any of those letters? No, no, not at all. 
Um, I think at the time the club secretary and the PR woman actually wouldn't let me open them anyway. So if I did, probably, you know, I'll be looking through the curtain at night, just, you know, wondering what's going to happen. Yeah. What happened to your social life after that? Um, I was just always, you know, wherever you went, it would be, you know, look, there's the guy who broke Darby's leg. It wasn't, you know, there's Dan Smith, the young Southern player. It was, that's the one thing I'd, I'd probably say was the, the most negative part of, uh, of all that that went on. Um, and you'd be looked at as a completely different player, you know. And before that, I don't even think I ever picked up a yellow card. You know, I'd probably count on one hand in all my career that I picked up yellow cards, you know. Um, and it was always, you know, that's Dan Smith who, who broke the Arby's leg. And that was that after that, and it was kind of stamped with, with, with my name, really. How did your family cope? Um, it was, again, they, they knew what, what sort of person and what sort of player I was. Um, they just had to take it on the chin as well. Um, they, they, they didn't really get involved. It, it just one of them things I'd see it in the paper and, and it would kind of just, that would be it. So the season ends. Mm -hmm. Next season you're at Aberdeen, is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. How was that season for you? Um, started off really well. Um, it, it was a move I didn't really expect, to be honest. Um, I got offered a, a contract at Sunland and I was being pretty young and naive and I got advice to, to move move clubs. You had an uh, agent? Yeah. And, and the advice was, I got a, I think it was a two-year contract offer from, from Sunland uh, and a four-year contract offer from, from Aberdeen. And my agent said, he advised me to, you know, move on and you're still young, you might be able to, you know, get more games there and all the rest of it. And it just wasn't to be. Um, started off fairly well and it just really... I wouldn't say I sort of, my heart wasn't in it, it was just more of I knew I made a bad mistake by moving there rather than staying at Sunland because I was really highly thought of. Okay. After that, you then went through a succession of clubs. Mm. Was it just more of the same there? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I think with, with me, I was, if I didn't play at, a, at the highest level, I knew I, well, I was obviously capable of doing, otherwise I wouldn't, wouldn't have played there. Um, I just felt after that football, I didn't look at it the same way. Um, and it kind of, I just went from league to league to league, you know, and it's just something I thought to myself, but if I don't play a high level, I don't really want to play at all in a serious matter. So how did the move to Australia come about? Um, I totally out of the blue, actually. I was playing at Gateshead, um, and long story short, basically Dave, I knew Luke Carr, who, who played a couple of years ago, um, and Luke Proctor. And he said, look, Dave Reed's going to give you a call. Um, he was an Aberdeen fan, and he seen me play and all the rest of it, and said, "Look, do you fancy?" I was kind of dead wood at Gateshead, to be honest. I was sitting, I wasn't enjoying football, wasn't really playing, had an injury, wasn't getting back in the squad, and it was frustrating. And I thought, "Look, a, cha a change would be nice." And I only expected to come out for a year, and two and a half years later, here I am. And you know, I've got no intention of leaving Australia. I absolutely love the place, and right now I consider it home. So when you came here, you, you're in a club that's in the Fifth tier yeah. in the ladder. Yeah. What were your initial thoughts? When I spoke to Dave, he said, look, we, we've got a really strong team. We're starting to make additions. We, we, you know, he told the story of the whole church league days and, and all the rest of it and where the club's wanting to be and where the club is now. And our intentions were always to, to quickly bypass the leagues. Um, and so far, so good. I mean, we've, I think we've recruited really well. We've got a great set of lads. And, you know, just to think of where the clubs came from when I first signed to where, where they are now, it's an you know, astronomical achievement, really. Um, never mind when they're in the church league, so it's brilliant. How do you rate the standard here? Um, I think this season has been a test for the boys. I think we've, we've risen to the test, but you can see as you go up the leagues, the standard's starting to get better, and, and I think it's still a pretty new sport. Um, it's still very, very early days. I mean, when you compare it to England and Scotland and all the rest of it, you can see it's a bit of a sleeping giant, in my opinion. Um, and I think they're starting to creep in and, and get a lot better players. Um, and you can see more people want to actually come over. What sort of routes have you laid down here? Um, I mean, I try to sort of... It's one of them where I sort of look at the club and I think it could, it could go places. Um, but my roots are just, just being with the boys and, and trying to put in as much effort as I possibly can um, and try and stay here as long as I can.
It's pretty but you've, you've got a partner? You've oh, yeah. Um, no, I'm actually, no, I haven't got oh. a partner. No. Um, so it's kind of, it's not really, um, it's not an issue. I mean, it's, it's something that eventually I'd like a, to settle, settle down over here, um, certainly. And I've got no intentions of going back home. And fingers crossed, I get me PR next year. And that'll be me, that'll be me staying. Yeah. Do you miss Sunderland at all? Yes and no. I'd probably say no to the fact that you were always that, you know, you are seen as, as, as that person who broke Diaby's leg, and I think that'll never go. Uh, I think it's one of them things that'll, that'll always remain. Um, and yes, the fact that my family's there, and it's, it's still it's great to still go to the games, it's, it's still a good club. Um, but in terms of the weather and all the rest of it, I know where I'd rather be, and it's definitely here. Yeah. <coughs> And just finally, Dan, what was the craziest thing that you ever did as a player? Sort of off the field <coughs> stuff. We hear stories about, you know, players throwing the money out and all that sort of thing. Did What's the craziest thing you ever were a part of? Um, I'd probably say there was a guy called um, Ian Graham who was playing in the, the, um, the reserves and putting it politely, he was really concerned about his hair thinning. Um, best way I thought possible to get to do a prank on him was to put hair removal cream in his shampoo. Left it for five minutes, tried to keep him talking in the shower. Um, and he just started to see his clumps of hair coming out. And funny enough, it didn't actually grow back because it was that thin to start with. Yeah, so he wasn't too happy and he's still bald now. So that, that's <laughs> something that does please me a lot. Yeah. Dan Smith, thank you very much. Not a problem. Thanks, mate. Cheers.